So when did you start in dogs and what made you choose the breeds you chose? It's about 10 years ago. And I was, I was young. I was like 14 years old. Um, and I chose the press canario because I had been seeing them online for years because I've, I've always loved dogs. Um, I had Boston terriers and Cocker spaniels and German shepherds and that kind of shit when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Um, but I wanted something different. And so I started looking into Cane Corsos and then that led me into Dogo Argentinos and that led me into Pressas. And when I was a kid, I saw Sanders Kennels and I was like, Oh, you know, this guy's awesome. He's got like 50 dogs. Um, you know, they all do this protection work and, you know, I want to know how this works. So Mm -hmm. when I was uh, 14, I asked my grandmother, I was like, listen, I, you know, you know, I've been talking to you about buying me a dog and, uh, this is where I want to get it from. I said, we're going to need, you know, probably 1500 or $2,000. <laughs> that's, you know, cause that's just what they go for. And she was like, okay. So she drove me up to Dawsonville, Georgia. Um, I knew I couldn't afford a puppy because puppies were $3,000. Mm. So I called ahead of time and I said, Hey, uh, Noah, you know, do you have anything that's older that you would let go of for like a grand or $1,500? Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, you know, I've got a bunch of young females, you know, anywhere from nine months old to about a year and a half. Um, I've got too many. I'm not keeping all of them for my program. So if you want to, you can come and pick one up. And I said, all right. So I went out there. I looked over the kennels. I looked over the dogs. We took them out. We interacted with them. I walked away with a 10 month old female for a thousand dollars. She was just the best dog I ever had. She was fantastic. She protected me with her life. She had incredible prey drive, incredible trainability, and I was hooked. And about six months later, um, I decided that I definitely wanted more of these dogs. So I called someone else that I had been in contact with in Florida, and he told me he had some adult presses he was looking to let go of. Mm -hmm. And so I said, all right, I came down. I came there just to buy a male to breed with my female. Um, and I ended up purchasing a male who was about five years old at the time named King. King was off of Red Star Harif. Red Star Harif was from Red Star Kennels, who back in the day of presses in the early 2000s, they were, you know, they were the it people. They were a big name. Mm -hmm. Um, so he was a Red Star Harif son bred to Sanders Malibu. So he was also, you know, some of the same blood as my female which I liked, you know, so I bought him for $500. The guy then told me, Hey, I've got two of his daughters in the back. If you want to take them with you as well, I'll just give them to you. Mm. And he was, and I was like, all right, I got them. These dogs had never seen a vehicle, a person other than him. Um, anything. They were crazy skittish, crazy nervy, crazy wanting to bite me. It took me three days to get them out of their crates mm. when I got them home. And uh, ever since then, man, I, I bred King and Chica. And that was a, those are my first breeding pair of presses. And I've been doing presses ever since. On and off, I've had as few as three or four, and I've had as many as 30. Okay. So what – let me ask you this because, um, I mean, I did the, the quick breed video on Presa Canario. But what separates the Pressa from, say, the Dogo or the Corso? What What is different about them? As far as a Pressa goes, now, Dogos are an amazing breed. I've owned them. I love them. They're awesome dogs. Um, I want to incorporate them in my band dogs. However, those are more along the lines of a hog dog, I feel personally. Um, you get more prey drive out of them than you do man drive most of the time depending obviously on who you buy your dog from, but I'm talking on an average basis. Um, the Dogo would be more of a hog dog, a hunting dog to me. A mm-hmm. press is more of a man dog. Um, I chose them because of consistency of temperament. I didn't like the inconsistencies I saw in the Connie Corso. I liked the fact that I saw that more than half of a litter of pressas usually had some workability, which is a consistency that I hadn't seen in a lot of other molossers. Mm-hmm. 
I think among the medium-sized working Molosser field that the Presa Canario is over the Connie Corso and the Dogo Argentino for versatility and consistency of workability. That's not to say that there isn't an exceptional Connie Corso that will beat out a mediocre Presa because there sure is. Mm-hmm. But on a, not on a case by case basis, but on the whole, I feel the Pressa is superior to other Molossers in the same category. That is my answer 90% of the time, unless you find exceptional examples of other breeds. Another breed I'm a big fan of as far as consistency of temperament is the Borble. Tell the world what you have going on right now as far as all your programs. Tell the world, like, all your crosses, exactly what you're doing. Just enlighten people on what, you know, Chambers Canine has going on. Sure, absolutely. Right now, I'm in the process of rebuilding gradually um, mm-hmm. a press scenario program because I have had, you know, very few of them over the last couple of years. And so I've just started buying some new stock for that program. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm basically what I'm trying to do. I have a stud named Bravo. He is a physically and as far as trainability, exceptional animal. He is what I want my male presses to look like. Um, the reason that I have purchased females from different lines than him is because he comes from a lot of show lines mm-hmm. and I don't want just a show type of a dog. So I've purchased some females with Iron Bull Blood, Irema Corto, and a few other lines that I feel are going to enhance the workability of his offspring. Mm -hmm. So we were talking off record before, and you mentioned something about um, performance and workability crossed to the the look of things as far as the presses are concerned. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, absolutely. I want a dog who aesthetically pleases me and who looks like a press of canario. I don't want my dog to look like a an American Pit Bull Terrier cross band dog. I don't want them to look that way because it is supposed to be a press of canario. They're a molosser. They're supposed to have an intimidating presence. They're supposed to have a certain set. I believe in the breed standard 100%. I believe a lot of people, when they start talking about the working dogs, they lose sight of the standard Mm -hmm. and they lose sight of what the dog is supposed to look like. Because if you're talking about preserving a breed, you can't just preserve the traits that you want. You have to preserve the dog as a whole. Mm -hmm. What is a bull herder and why did you get involved? So a bull herder is a cross of any bull breed with any herding breed, technically. Um, The typical cross you're going to see is American Pit Bull Terrier and Malinois. But I've seen a lot of dogs that are American Bulldog with Dutch Shepherd and Malinois. I've seen Pressa bred to Malinois. And I've seen some great results from those dogs. The bull herder brings a trainability, a handler focus, and a tenacity that I don't see from a lot of stubborn bull breeds. And so I want to incorporate a bull herder or several bull herders into my band dog program to bring up the trainability, the handler focus, and just the overall intelligence of the dog. Can you dive deeper on that? Like the Malinois is definitely handler focused and they're more of a militant breed. But then uh, of course, when you're tossing in the bull breeds, those are the no quit attitude type breeds. Have you ever had any problems with um, maybe the, the dominance of the shepherd types crossing over into the bull breed or vice versa? Absolutely. And that's why culling, and I don't mean culling in the sense of killing a dog, I mean culling in the sense of pet homes, or whatever your version of culling is, is an extremely important part of any band dog or any working dog program. Because there's going to be puppies in a bull herder litter that aren't cut out for the job. Because simply put, you're taking two breeds that have nothing to do with each other and throwing them together with the hope of the best results. You're not always going to get the best results. You have to be able to determine which ones are the best and go from there because you're going to get some dogs that are overly stubborn. You're going to get some dogs that don't have the desired temperament, that don't have the desired structure, that just don't have what you're looking for. So you have to learn how to select from a litter. And sometimes that requires keeping puppies until they're three, four, five months old 
because you don't know which puppy is going to have what you're looking for. Okay. So on your yard right now, how many breeds do you have as far as the crosses? Give the whole layout for the listeners so they know exactly what you're doing. All right, right now, um, as far as breeds as the whole, I've got a Borble Connie Corso stud named Zeus who came from Boxford Band Doggies. Um, they temperament and health tested all of their animals, exceptional breeders, and he's an exceptional animal. Um, I use American Bulldog, American Pit Bull Terrier, working lines of American Bully, Presa Canario, some Connie Corso crosses. I don't have any purebred Connie Corsos, but I do have Corso crosses. Mm -hmm. um, and I also have, of course, the Bull Herder, which is American Pit Bull Terrier, Malinois, and Dutch Shepherd. I'm also working with a Dalmatian puppy which is my wife, girlfriend's project. Um, she wants to create sort of a mock herder using the intelligence and trainability of the Dalmatian uh, with the, the bull breeds. Okay. Now, how many generations in on that are you, or is that just a brand new project? That is brand new. Okay. Um, right off the rip, this is the first Dalmatian that I've personally worked with. Um, I've seen several other people, including Cali catchers, using them for catch work, mm -hmm. and it intrigued me because I never thought of a Dalmatian as being a catching type of a dog or a hunting dog in general. Mm -hmm. um, I had thought of the breed as pretty much ruined like I do many others. Mm -hmm. I was able to find an example of the breed who does not have any hearing issues, doesn't have any health issues, and has an amazing temperament that I think will bring something to the table when she's put to a bull breed. So for the listeners, what does the Dalmatian bring to the table? The se Well, essentially, um, I could get more elaboration from my girlfriend. She's the one who's super interested in these dogs. But essentially what she's trying to bring is the same things as the Malinois brings intelligence, trainability, athleticism, willingness to please, but on a less intense scale. So they're a little easier to work with because Malinois are not for a novice trainer. They're not for a novice dog person at all because they're a very high intensity animal. Okay. That makes sense. When it comes to the band dog, we've been talking before and you did mention Lee, you brought up a uh, reptar and a couple of his dogs on his yard. Uh, what was the end goal and who did you want to breed one of Lee's dogs to? I have an American Pit Bull Terrier, American Bulldog cross female named Rosie with an extremely high prey drive who I am considering taking to one of H. Lee's studs. I believe that his dogs will bring the man drive that she lacks. She has an extreme prey drive, but not a lot of man drive. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to bring out some of the man drive while maintaining the, the prey drive because I do want catch dogs, but I want them to be able to work a man as well. Okay, so if you were to break down um, your whole yard, and I know you have 30 plus dogs, if you were to break down your whole yard, how many programs do you have happening at this moment? At this moment, I would say three with another two to three in concept. Um, I have a lot of projects that are still in the concept phase, some that are not even have the dogs purchased for those projects yet. Um, I, I plan on making the bull herder and the band dog project one. I want to bring them together so that eventually all of my band dogs have, you know, even a small percentage of my bull herder in them. So your bull herder, um, just to reiterate, your bull herder is crossed with what? American pit bull terrier, Dutch shepherd and Malinois. That's a nasty combination. That is something very, very serious. Absolutely. And her intelligence and her handler focus and her trainability are all very much on point. She had proven herself to produce workers before I even purchased her. Mm -hmm. um, she has a seven-month-old son who's working on PSA right now. Amazing animal. Amazing animal. Okay. So you've spoke about before 
just in our own conversation of a, a watchdog female or a, um, some type of bully female from the from the old blood. Yeah. Talk yes. a little more I, about that. Uh, let people know who that is. I have a female named Layla who is from old Razor's Edge bloodlines combined with Watchdog bloodlines. I'm a big fan of the older bully lines like Gaff, Watchdog, um, Grey Line, and I have incorporated those with her. And I also have a female band dog from Sam McCool of Copperhead Road Kennels. Um, she is 50% Connie Corso and 50% watchdog slash sorrels. So she's 25% game dog, 25% American bully, and 50% Connie Corso. And she has a litter on the ground right now that at five weeks old are exhibiting a lot of the features that I was hoping for from that crossing. Mm. Very cool. The American bully. Let's talk about that for a second. Sure. You and I... You and I both know what we expected from the American bully when it first came to the scene versus where it is now. Yeah. What do you look for? What do you look for personally in the American bully? If I'm going to use an American bully, then I have to have the drive, the uh, guard ability, everything that it was intended to have in the very beginning. Really the stuff that you saw before the name American bully even came about. Mm -hmm. Um, I prefer the older type dogs. I don't like the shorter squatty, um, wide headed, you know, useless dogs. Um, mm -hmm. they don't have a purpose, you know, grant you chihuahuas do not have a purpose. So a hundred percent, you know, do you on what you want to do. But if I'm going to own an American bully, then it's going to have to be able to do its job because I don't feed 80 pound dogs or more uh, to have a dog who won't protect me. Mm -hmm. What some people call an XL pit bull or a working pit bulldog is what I expect out of an American bully. Right. American bullies were game dogs crossed to Amstaffs and there was some Mastiff influence absolutely or you wouldn't have 100 plus pound dogs without a exactly. massive i grew up thinking the 80 to 90 pound blue dogs were pit bulls mm -hmm. because that's what everybody called them yeah um now those dogs a lot of the time were man aggressive those dogs a lot of the time wouldn't let you come in the yard um but they weren't pit bulls they were bullies mm -hmm. um, they were called pit bulls but this was before right. that this was before the name bully was even attached to them Right, and even now you see a plague of people who don't understand the difference who label, you know, 80 to 100 pound blue dogs as pit bulls. Um, and the problem is people treat the word pit bull like an umbrella term when that's not what it's meant to be. Yeah. Honest opinion to me, um, UKC American pit bull terriers most of the time are Amstaffs, in my opinion. Yes, just without, um, the, just without the nose color restriction. Right. Exactly. So, okay. in my opinion, if you want to talk about a show type and a working type pit bull terrier, then you're talking about a pit bull terrier and an Amstaff, which at this point are two separate breeds to the point that there's genetic diver divergence that can differentiate the two breeds from each other in a DNA test. So, if your dog is so different from mine, that even people who are really new to the dog world, which is genetic scientists and people that are doing breed breakdowns can tell the difference in their DNA, then they're not the same dog. They're related. They're like cousins, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're one in the same, but they're also not. The UKC American Pitbull Terrier should be relabeled an American Staffordshire Terrier. Absolutely. And I think that the people who have refused to, first of all, there's very few real pit bull terriers registered with the UKC. Mm. Um, the people that have refused to turn over their pit bull terrier papers for American bully papers, I think those people should be forced. I think everybody in the UKC should have to send pictures of their dogs and then I think that a person who's qualified should go over those photos and determine the breed of the dog. Mm -hmm. Because 
the fact is that there's still so many dogs being mislabeled as pit bull terriers and the mislabeling to the public is never going to stop until the breeders stop doing it themselves. A hundred percent. 